Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to another episode of the Versus Stars podcast, third season. All my loyal listeners, thank you for your continued support. It's an amazing episode because Jordan Hart and David Ebeltoff forced the mothership to discuss the cabinet from Image Comics. Now come aboard as we go traversing the stars. Hi, Mr. Hart and Mr. Ebeltoff. Thank you so much for coming to the Versus Stars podcast. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Totally my pleasure. So I always start off with a question of inspiration to inspire your love for comics and who are your earliest influences. Oof. Jordan, you want to go with that one first? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, earliest, earliest comic influences. We're going to go back to the image boys. That'd be Jim Lee, Todd McFarlane and uh, Rob Liefeld. X-Men number one uh, by Jim Lee was my first single issue. I got it when I was six years old from the grocery store. And uh, that's what started my comic obsession. And then I went into a store with my dad and saw Todd's uh, Spider-Man was like, holy crap. And then of course found X-Force. So they were uh, definitely my early, uh, earliest inspiration uh, in the comic realm. And then I would say as time, you know, really went on, it kind of just went through the legends, you know, you get to Tim Sale, Bendis, uh, Matt Fraction, Brian K. Vaughn, you know, like, I know those are those are the easy names, but you know they're they're definitely uh, a, a huge, huge inspiration. Gail Simone uh, as well, love love her work. Can't wait for her to jump on X Men this summer. I uh, I think it's going to be great. So, yeah, I'd say pretty much the uh, the original Image crew were were my big uh, inspirations. How about you, Mister Ebotov? Yes. Um. So I came. I. Read Punisher War Journal back in the day. That was sort of my on ramp to comics. But admittedly, I strayed. I strayed from comics. So, um, you know, white males with huge revenge complexes and big old guns were really, really cool for me in my early teens. <laughs> but, uh, but I sort of swayed away from them. Um, and I didn't come back to comics until the aughts, really. So uh, I read a lot of books and I did a lot of, you know, I mean, Vonnegut and Asimov. And uh, I also got really geeky with a bunch of fantasy novels. So um, when I came back to comics, Jordan actually introduced me to Tim Seeley's work. And so I, I'm going to I'm going to throw Tim Seeley down there just just because uh, his sort of ability to mesh humor and action and some really, really uh, hard hitting dramatic moments. I just love he he's he seamlessly sort of like blends all those together. So Hack Slash, I'm a huge horror fan. So Hack Slash was, was really, really fun to read and still is. Um, and Revival, um, you know, Jordan's in Wisconsin right now. So we got to we got to bring that up. So uh, and then, yeah, going to all the big names that, that Jordan mentioned, I would piggyback off of those. But yeah, Tim Seeley, I think, really sort of made me realize like, yo, we can really write really, really fun, adventurous, crazy, mm. crazy things, um, but do it in a in a in an intellectual manner. Mm. So you're both writers of a combo code cabinet from Image Comics. Um, so what inspired the creation of the series? And one thing I always find fascinating is co-writing i find someone who's never really co-written something before i always wonder how those dynamics actually function sure uh, uh do you want to take the inspiration jordan and then i'll take the other one yeah that'd be great uh okay. inspiration is so the cabinet is uh named after our magical device which is a 16th uh or 17th century curio cabinet uh that's that's dutch it's about four feet high and it's full of just tiny drawers and some are hidden some are visible it's got oil paintings bone gold like all these crazy things built into it uh and the inspiration comes from real life the the cabinets were real they were called ca cabinet schranks uh which is german and um which is german for display cabinet i should say and there is one at the getty museum in los angeles uh where i was living and it was a heat wave, so my wife and I needed to get into some air conditioning. <laughs> so we went to the Getty Museum, and sure enough, there was the cabinet shrunk uh, on display. And it was just like, it just like was magnetic. It just pulls you in. It's just like gothic and creepy and evil, but like interesting. 
Um, and at the time, you know, David will take it here about co-writing, but, you know, we had decided we wanted to work on a comic together. We we're trying to like think what it would be. We wanted it to be something new, not uh, ideas we either of us had had in the past. And I uh, texted him a picture. I was like, I feel like this might be it. And immediately he was like, that's it. Let's do it. So, uh, so we, we started from there. But yeah, the inspiration comes from real life and from a Santa Ana heat wave, I would say. So thank you, Santa Ana wins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so uh, what we did and really how our co-writing process works is we have a really great uh, friendship base before that. Um, Jordan had my number and was able to text me because we were friends for many, many years prior. And we really cemented our friendship off of fandom. Uh, we're both, uh, as we already mentioned, from the Midwest, we're both hardcore Buffy the Vampire Slayer fans. Um, a lot of the comics that we just mentioned for inspirations, Jordan shared with me or I didn't share with Jordan, but again, Jordan shared with me. And um, and so, yeah, we really sort of uh, created this great sort of, you know, bully base uh, for, our, for our overall, you know, dish uh, of what we loved and what we didn't love and what we wanted to work with. And so it was sort of springboarding off of that. We, um, we sort of exchanged ideas in the first, boy, I don't know. What do you think, Jordan? Like two, three years, we developed the property for a good spell because mm -hmm. we wanted it to be, we wanted it to be uh, something that we could both find a lot of fun and a lot of amusement right. in. And so our sort of writing process is really coming up with something great, just like Jordan did when he saw the cabinet at the Getty and texting the other person and being like, what do you think? And then we both sort of ping pong that back and forth and get inspired from each other's ideas. Um, and then for the actual writing process, it's extremely important because this is my first time writing for comics. I mainly mm. write for a film. Um, so it was really, really important when I started to tap on the keys with early drafts to have an expert that's been reading comics since pulling young blood off the shelf in what was that? 91, 92. I'm going to 91, uh, 92. 92. Yeah. 92. 92 was young blood. Yep. So, you know, having Jordan just be so steeped within the true visual idea of the medium was really, really great for me. Cause I was able to write stuff and he was like, okay, this is great, but let's pull it back. Let's make this more visual. Let's really write to make sure the art shines. Uh, this, you know, these three sentences are awesome, but make sure that we get them across in, in a more succinct manner because they're going to read that panel fast and they're not going to. So it was really, really cool to have uh, more of an expert uh, that I was able to bounce ideas off of. And um, and yeah, he, and he really kept sort of the blinders on me. So I didn't get, you know, too, uh, too verbose. Like yeah, I did, like I did with my answer, basically. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> and, and, and just like, I think an overall statement is, David, is this the first thing you've really co-written with someone, right? You're usually... So for the most part, yeah, for mm -hmm. the most part, I've I've co-written stories for scripts that I've written with with the director Rod Blackhurst, but in usually when it comes to the screenplay, it's usually myself. So yeah, this yeah, is the first the first go around. Yeah, and this was my first comic uh, co-writing uh, as well. And I think the key to co-writing is, um, you know, uh, just knowing that uh, you probably. Um, aren't going to have the best ideas all the time and like n recognizing when something is you know uh, when it's time to compromise you know what I mean like a marriage you know what I mean it's like if you really want to dig on on something like you got to really love it but but you know David makes it easy because he's just such a great writer like he takes a little kernel that I have and just like grows a full I can't think of the metaphor at the moment but you know yeah. he's he's <laughs> yes he, he polishes it so yeah. Uh, so yeah so it's like um, just really, you know, being open to ideas, being open to other ideas and, uh, yeah, putting the work first and saying, okay, am I fighting for this idea or this line of dialogue because I wrote it or because it serves the story the best? And if you put the story first, uh, co-writing is really easy. <laughs> That's something I always wondered about because believe it or not, this might be a generalization, but I haven't done some of my own writing. Writers do have pretty good egos about things, especially about their own words. And when you work with somebody else, you're combating on some level an ego because you want what your idea was, your part of your of the baby to be out there. You know, the baby to have your eyes and your whatever. Mm -hmm. um, how hard is it to relinquish that level of control and ego to make sure that the comic book is equally both your voices? Yeah, I, I think it's it. It really depends depends on the person. I think uh, at at first, it's it's very hard for some people to do that. You know, like I've I've done projects, even non writing projects with partners that do not want to compromise. And it's like this is my idea. 
and and they just will shoot down everything else I have to get their idea through. And and you know that to me is them putting themselves above the art. And you know, being a musician, I think it's the same thing in bands. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. uh, is the piece you have like is it serving you or is it serving the song? Um, so that's the mind frame I have. As David mentioned, we were friends for many years, which I. I think really helps too when you care about your partner and you are friends, you know, like I feel like that's, that's a big uh, recipe to how well we've, we've worked together, I think. Yeah. And um, just to piggyback off of that really fast, you know, there were times for sure where uh, I remember there was a few times in the second issue um, where Jordan's like, okay, I think, I think we should end on this, or I think we should do this. And, and so I would go and I, I was like, sweet. So I wrote both of his ideas and then I brought those ideas back and I was like, okay, which one should we do? And he was still so torn. He's like, ah, crap. I don't know what we should do. Um, and so there was a lot of times where we always want to try every idea that, that, that the other person has. And a lot of times when Jordan throws something in there and it might not make it in the issue that we're working on right now, but it does make it down the road because it's a great idea. It just might not be a great idea for where we're at right then and there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've had to sort of say like, okay, we should prioritize, as Jordan mentioned, prioritize the story, prioritize also that final layer, which is Chiara Romandi, our awesome artist. Mm. A lot of times, you know, we would sort of sit back and be like, okay, we both, we both know that this maybe will go differently. It's not his idea, Jordan's idea or my idea, but let's throw what we have jointly out there so that Chiara can make it her Mm. work and her idea. So we relied heavily on Chiara to, and we never really squabbled and we never really fought. We should, we should, mm-hmm. we should maybe fight now, Jordan. Should we get it out? Should we like, should we do that? Out? No. We get out on that. Yeah. I mean, traversing the stars, we could, we could definitely get something like we could do something astronomical here, but, um, but we've never really fought because we were always like, okay. And I think it helps that Jordan's a logical and understanding individual um, that is able to not, you know, have an ego overpower everything. But a lot of times we'd just be like, Ooh, we can't decide. Okay. Amazing artist. <laughs> yeah. let's, ha- let's have you decide. So, tie break. Be the tie, tie breaker. breaker Kiara. The tie breaker. Thank you. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So for, um, Mr. um, um, Evil Toft, um, as a, someone who's mostly a screenwriter, how difficult was the transition between screenwriting and comic writing? How different are they really? I, I think they're different. I, I, I've heard a lot of other screenwriters slash comic writers say that they're extremely similar. I think they're very similar because you are writing visually in both of them. You're writing for visual mediums. But, you know, writing for comics, you're extremely, extremely truncated, as you know, and as most of your listeners know. You have to be very, very succinct. What I'm able to do in a five minute scene between two characters that have two voices and I also have I can rely on uh, sound that's not, um, you know, explained via, uh, you know, via text. Mm-hmm. Um, I can rely on switching the camera a whole hell of a lot if I choose. Um, so what I have to do in those five minutes, I sometimes have to do uh, in two or three panels uh, or sometimes one panel. So I found it to be quite challenging, a really great challenge. Um, but I found it to be challenging because both Jordan and I wanted to move the reader in a fast pace. We, you know, our first issue is quite, quite jam packed with a lot of fun stuff. Our other issues are as well, but we wanted to move it at a fast clip. We wanted a great cadence. Um, and in doing so we had to really sort of find those freeze frame moments that I would write over a whole first act, but we had to find those freeze frame moments to get 10, 11 pages. So I found it, I found it very, I found it hard in the best way the the most rewarding hard there is. Um, uh, but also, you know, as I mentioned before, I wouldn't have found it rewarding without Jordan being able to guide me and be like, okay, cool. Here's that solution. Instead of me writing that 68 page comic script and being like, Hey, artist, 22 pages, five to seven panels of page, let's do this, you know, and, and then banging their head against the wall. So yeah, it's similar, but different, uh, different, but similar, both amazing, (laughs) both just different, great ways to tell the narrative. I mean, why even stop at seven panels? Do ten or twelve panels really make the artist go crazy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. You've done that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the, the but the script starts with "We are so sorry." Dot we dot do. dot. And then we panel do. one, parentheses of twelve, and then you know. So it's like, all right, we we covered it. We disclaimer it. Yeah. 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 
And then, then they come back to you with the higher bill. No, I want this much. Perfect. Yep. <laughs> <Thanks so> much. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so in the first issue, um, am I saying the name Avani? Is that correct? Avni. Of, of, say one more time. <laughs> sorry, Avni. Of me, sorry. Mm -hmm. no, um, so, uh, as we said, the, the name of the series is The Cabinet. So, she and Trent unleash a terrible demon. Uh, I'm going to say the name wrong. Uh, Volax? 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 Vol How do you say the name? <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> sorry. And I'm, I'm, of course, I drank. Jordan, take over because I'm going to cough here. Volax. Vol <laughs> I don't even really know how to say it. I just <laughs> typed it like 4,000 times, but like yeah. Valra Valraxon? Right? Valraxon. Yeah, yeah Val Valraxon. Yeah. Valraxon. Oh my God. It totally sounds like a drug that we see those commercials for. <laughs> totally. Like, yeah. Take, take Valraxon if you're, yep. Uh, yeah, for your skin condition. Sorry, mm -hmm. I'm cutting you <laughs> off, Jeff. Keep going. No problem. So um, the, the demon that I apparently cannot pronounce the name of. Uh, after it, it rises, it kills um, the parents of the other character. Apparently, I have money, but to pronounce correctly, Avani, uh, 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 Avni, Avni, yeah, Avni. So, yeah. okay. no, it's all good. It's a great Indian name that you know. My wife's Indian, so um, yeah, the phonetic spelling of so many of their names are just different, which is cool. I should have written my questions in phonetically to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, we're, we're giving you the phonetic run for your money. My last name, <laughs> demon yeah. name. yeah, sorry. I should just have a text pop up uh, with um, a computer. Who, you know, they do the name pronounce when you can do like YouTube pronounce this and have the oh. name come up. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um. Anyways, so um, the the demon kills um her parents. Um. So is the attempt is the goal of the story for them to undo the mistake? Can it be undone or to, pre to prevent that awful fate from happening to anyone else? I'd say a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. We are really working more with column A, which is her wanting to correct that mistake and the same magical properties that she tried to instigate um, that she made a mistake with and then unleashed the demon Valraxon to, you know, to that killed her parents. Um, those same magical powers, she's able to try to make the cabinet do differently and, and correct mistakes because the cabinet's magical powers work by placing different relics within different drawers. And Avni calls these relics doodads. That's sort of her childish term that she calls these uh, these relics. And if you put these different relics in different orders, uh, you're able to come out with different magical outcomes. And one of those magical outcomes that she's really striving for in our series is to be able to undo the past, undo her past mistake. But I love that you're sort of looking at it in even more broader terms where if she's able to correct her mistake, then she's also able to basically save a lot of individuals from this demon that she unleashed. Um, so we we like to say in the first issue that you know being heroic, it's it's not it's not it's not like a superpower. It's just being human. And so mm -hmm. her trying to correct her mistake is just a human reaction. And in doing so, she's going to sort of unleash all these benevolent uh, paths. You now know, to to dive in a little bit more into. What it means to fix what she did? Are we talking about going? Does this reset to um, back in time that it never happened, or do, do they reappear? And what is the level of responsibility that she's feeling, knowing what the ramifications of what she did do and what she could do to undo this could be for everyone else? You want me to take that one, Jordan, or you want? Yeah, to go? yeah, yeah. I'm, okay. I'm not. I'm not risking a spoiler here. So this, <laughs> this is all you. Oh shoot! I was I'm not going to be Tom Holland on, oh, on, was... on right now. So um, yeah, right. Uh, so oh, how could we say this without spoiling things? She, uh, the actual power. We we haven't gotten to the actual unleashing of the power that we'll need to. Yeah, either go back in time or either need to sort of or open portals or, you know, there's there's a few different ways that she could actually approach this to fix it. Uh, the one thing I will spoil is I will say that within our current arc, within our current five issue arc, um, she doesn't fix her mistake. I think that's OK to say. Right, Jordan? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because every single time we try to fix a mistake, we unleash more mistakes mm. and we you know, like fixing mistakes, never easy. Like we mentioned in the first issue, you have that great eraser, you know, you have, you flip that pencil, that number two pencil over and you have that eraser. Well, sometimes you get that eraser that's super hard and it just like rips the paper and it gets that like terrible orange, you know, rubberized skin mark. Yeah. Skin like mark, that. The yeah. Rubberized mm -hmm. skin mark. 
So we, what we really try to do throughout the series is we try to make her and Trent and the different people that we bring in, the different people we bring into the fold. We have, you know, the sort of clandestine organization called the Black Guards. We have uh, a great semi-benevolent organization called the Custodians and all these different characters that start to come into play. They affect how she's able to try to fix this mistake. And as they affect it, it gets more and more complicated. And the mistake that she's trying to fix she starts to realize that that mistake might have been uh, set in motion even before she was around. Mm -hmm. And so she starts to uncover mysteries. She starts to uncover uh, further ideas of her past and her parents um, that just really, really complicate it and really just stir that pot. So when you're thinking about the cabinet, because we know what at least, um, what it could be, because like I said, the demon gets released and does horrible things, is the cabinet then inherently um and a potential for evil or potentially good is it on its own um does it have without going through like a star wars thing a good side and a dark side or is it whoever uses it it is a reflection of the user yeah i i think i i think the latter you know i think mm, when david and i were working on this uh human beings all have the capacity to be good or bad to make a good decision or a bad decision you know uh and all human beings are not perfect. They do good things and bad things. So that's how we kind of treated the cabinet, right? So it's it's really in the hand of the beholder. But then you look at Avni, um, she did something very bad on accident, right? So you gotta you gotta know what you're you're doing. It's just so much power that you have to know what you're doing. And if you don't, accidents are gonna happen. And as David said, you know, all kids play with matches. Uh, maybe they burn the carpet or or whatever. Uh, Avni's matches ended up killing her parents on accident, right? With the cabinet. So yeah, um, yeah. yeah it's just being careful uh, to tell that line. Yeah, I'd say, I, 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 yeah, Jordan hit all the main points. I'd say we're, I'd say the cabinet's chaotic neutral. I would say that is definitely for all the mm -hmm. D&Ders out there. And also, you know, we, because we are kids in the 90s, we mentioned our really cool references before with Jim Lee and um, X-Men and Youngblood, but we also have a lot of not so cool references like Aladdin, the Disney movie, you know, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and so we really sort of treated it, you know, sort of like the lamp where, as Jordan mentioned, it is this power that, all right, you throw it, you know, in Aladdin's hands and, and we can do well, you throw it in Jafar's, you know, and oi, um, mm -hmm. it, it, it could, it could get bad and everybody all of a sudden is wearing red clothes for some odd reason, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah, I I don't know, Jordan. I might have dug ourselves in a pretty pretty dorky hole there. No, 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 no. That was great. That was All great. Right. Cool. Yeah. So another thing I really enjoyed about the third issue is the the addition of music, because um, you, you have this world that's kind of like ours, but also has magic involved. Now you're introducing Van Halen and Metallica. So how much of this um, world is ours? How much of the world is something different? And how much is music a let's say something that adds depth to the world that you're creating? Uh, I, I would say this world is with, is ours just with with the cabinet in it. You know, there's no superheroes or anything like that. So, yeah, it's 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 our 1991 uh, just with this supernatural. I mean, David uh, mentioned Buffy. I think that's a great you know reference like Buffy was us. It's just Sunnydale happened to be the hellmouth where things were really weird, <laughs> but everything else was normal. So, you know, that's that's the cabinet. And. Uh, yeah, to answer your question about music, uh, David and I both love music, so it's you know it's a big part of our lives. But the music in the late eighties, early nineties was just so good and and so popular. You know, Madonna, Michael Jackson. I mean, just the amount of household names that came uh, during. We're set in nineteen ninety one, and there's like that picture of the uh, the rock el rock albums alone, just that genre that came out in ninety one, and it was like. Nirvana, Smells Like Teen Spirit, or, or uh, never mind. It was Guns N' Roses. Guns N Roses. Uh, it was the Black Album by Metallica. It was Soundgarden. Like it yeah. was just since uh, I think Red Hot Chili Pe Peppers, even Blood Sugar Sex Magic came yeah. out in ninety one. It's like these insane once in a lifetime albums all came out within a month, six month period of each other. So yeah, we try to like pull as much of that into our story as possible, and also. Of me being 18 years old, Trent being, you know, a college student, they're they're very in tune with pop culture at the time. So yeah, that's just one thing we could uh we could easily pull in that we thought readers would would get pretty quickly too. There is a 
TGIF reference uh, in an upcoming issue. I was like, I'm not. That's not a spoiler. So yeah, yeah there's we're, TGIF. We're full house, yeah. Family Matters. What are we talking here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All, like, well, <laughs> we'll leave it there. But yeah, <laughs> like I said, I think I think I might be a little older than both. I'm born 1980, so I do remember Good. that time. I, you know, formative years. Yeah, oh, I'm 82. Jeff, J- Jordan, Jordan's a few years younger. Than this he's. 91 no oh, yes, yeah you, I you were one you were one years old when you pulled off young blood no uh jordan's a few years younger than us but um sorry i cut you off please go no so no i remember how good the music um uh, was going to that time period are we going to see like smash and pumpkins show up anything like that or what's going on here i i'll just step in really fast jordan then you can you can say what's going on uh, the other really big inspiration for trent our 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 sidekick um of any sidekick and we really wanted to create this sort of han and chewy like idea trent's very tall he's a midwest mm-hmm. jock um and jordan is extremely tall and he played football in in high school and he was really good and he is a hardcore metalhead so yeah at the end of our issue three um you'll see a little advertisement going to a song that jordan wrote and plays uh by the you know fictitious band suplex that we introduced in in the cabinet so the metal the metal reference that we injected into our sidekick is really because jordan is that individual and we love when we're able to sort of bring ourselves into our own work um but we also know that just because you wear a jock jacket just because you wear a letterman's jacket doesn't mean you can't thrash and doesn't mean you can't love comics, you know, it doesn't mean you can't mm-hmm. uh, properly quote, you know, Buffy like Jordan did a few minutes ago. So we wanted to also juxtapose that idea that, you know, there's a lot of nerds everywhere and there's a lot of metalheads everywhere. And, you know, Trent's hair is a little more clean cut than some of the metalheads remember from the eighties and nineties, but that doesn't matter. He can still headbang with the best of them. So. You don't want to get in a mosh pit with a <laughs> six, seven college athlete. Like just imagine if, that. Like if I'm, going, friends, yeah. if I'm friends with that guy, I will totally, because you will be the most protected individual there, but yes. Very right. true. So, Very yeah. true. Yeah. So, I mean, this is like maybe one of the more important questions um, because you do have the fictitious band suplex in my head, I'm feeling sort of like the Wild Stallions from Bill and Ted, where, you know, they did make music under the title Wild Stallions. Are we going to get like a suplex album maybe that coincides with their comic books at some point? You know, make it real? Or was I it- mean, that that would be great. We have, we have <laughs> one awesome. song out right now uh, that just... You yeah, have a single. Really? Yeah, a single. yeah, we have a single. It's on, it's on Spotify and Amazon Music. So, yeah, it came out when Issue 3 released. So... Uh, it's free. Go go listen. It's called Power Cloak by Suplex with two X's. Yeah. Uh, and, and and that's what our boy Trent's going to be listening to, you know, right before he lugs around that heavy ass cabinet yes. on his back or or, or everything. So and, y- really? y- I didn't know there was. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's up. So it would it would be nice to turn it into a full album. I just might need to clone myself first. So I have enough time yeah. to write comics yeah. and letter and everything I know. else. And, but... and I, I the last instrument I played was the recorder in third grade. So like I cannot help Jordan. Uh, with any of this musical talent but Jeff you mentioned long ago how music will will go you know go forward with our series you know we we have an arc two we you know this is our first arc of five issues and we do wrap it up in a nice little bow but we do also leave it open-ended for more because we would love to create more and within Mm -hmm. that second arc there is a lot more music and a Mm -hmm. lot more music um, that really plays I'm going to say it plays with like that satanic panic idea that uh, it plays with that. Oh, if we play this album backwards, what's going to happen? So we play with a lot of those like musical cultural references in the late eighties, early nineties, and we weave them into our story. And we're really excited to, to launch it. We just, we just have to make sure we can launch it. So yeah, yeah. So maybe not a set, maybe not a full album, but definitely a, a full album within the awesome panels that our artist creates Kiara for, for yep. the second arc. So I'm saying a soundtrack would, would work very nicely. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> so another fun character, I'm going to probably say his name wrong, is Gorbelly. You got that right. Nailed it. Hey, Nailed it. One out of three. One out of three, it's one out of four, actually. <laughs> one out of four isn't so bad for a show of mine. Anyway, so Gorbelly, he's, he's, he's a very interesting character. So how does his character come about? And why is he beholden to the demon, who I will try not to say the name of, because I apparently won't get it right. Um, and what motivates his worldview? You want me to take that one, Jordan? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Gorbelly is... is, is... That that's all you, so I, I can't wait okay. to hear this. Yeah. <laughs> so um Gorebelly 
is our foot soldier. He is the foot soldier for the Black Guards, which is this clandestine organization I mentioned that worships the demon Velraxxon. And because the cabinet was created back in the Baroque times, um, a lot of the Black Guards are sort of stuck within those Baroque times. So they wear these, you know, this uh, 16th, 17th century garb that looks like it's leaping out of a Flemish painting, like a Jean Van Eck painting or something. And, mm. um, and you know, they, they carry maces and clubs and, you know, there's no firearms in our cabinet uh, adventure. Um, and they do so because they are that great demon worshiping group that loves everything that this dark Lord wants to do with our, with our plane. But this Dark Lord is, is you know, is restricted, we will say, was let out mostly uh, to kill Avani's parents. But for the most part, this Dark Lord needs more power. So Gorbel is one of one of his foot soldiers. And he is that boisterous, uh, just overly, overly confident, um, you know, like he would totally be on the front lines of like, you know, the like Braveheart movie, you know, um, we always loved him, like love to sort of call him our like grizzled roadie from like a Blizzard of Oz tour. Um, <laughs> but he's also ridiculously loyal. He's very, very loyal. And um, and in a way, his sort of, uh, you know, you know, sort of gut busting and 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 uh, could be sort of annoying the loudest guy at the party. It's sort of endearing. So, um, yes, yeah, so we really wanted to play with him and we wanted him to be the antithesis to Trent. Trent is this loyal sidekick to Avni. Well, Gorbelly is this loyal sidekick to the Black Guards and he sort of becomes a loyal sidekick to this other Black Guard that's a little bit more mysterious, a little bit more um, secretive. Her name is Freya and she's harboring a dark secret that uh, is just starting to be unleashed in issue three, but will be unleashed more in issue four that's coming out in 13 days. Um, so yeah, and we love the way Kiara drew Gorbelli. You know, a lot of times you'll see his gut sort of poking through his uh, his mm -hmm. costume there. Um, so yeah, she named him Gorby, by the way, too, which I right. also love. She's just <laughs> like, "What do you think of Gorby in this panel?" Like I was like, "I love that nickname you made up, just as much as this panel." This is totally. this is great. Yeah, totally. So uh, so yeah, I, did I get all your questions? I don't think I did. Did I, Jeff? Oh. I can't. I'm sorry. She said uh, Gor uh, Gorby is a worshiper of, of the demon. <laughs> Why, though? What does he think the demon is going to do that will be either better or maybe even worse? I don't know. But, like, what does he expect to happen if he wins? So, then we get small, small, small hints of this right in the first part of issue two, where Gorbelli sort of talks about the sort of the bloodthirsty orgies that have occurred. Uh, when the Black Guards have sacrificed different things to their demonic lord. Mm. And so I always like to think that Gorbelli is doing this on the basis that he wants a world of pleasure. He wants a world where his loud voice and his bravado attitude will be fully celebrated. And it'll be fully celebrated while he's naked, howling at the moon, you know, covered in blood. And um, it's sort of that like, old Greek and Roman um, ideal of just being so bloodthirsty and in the moment like berserkers, you know? And I, so I feel like Gorbelli is sort of that warrior that's caught in 1991, but he is that warrior that wants to be at that time in the 16th, 17th century when it was just more acceptable to carry around a mace and clock somebody's skull if they didn't pay enough for grog. And so I always think Gorbelli sort of stuck in a different time and he wants to go back to that other time. That's why he's loyal. And that's why he, he really wants this to occur. As we'll see with most characters, you know, Gorbelli is going to be tried and tested too. Like his faith and his, his, uh, his arc is, is going to be tested and what he really wants um, and how he really wants to please his demonic Lord. That's going to come into question as, as we progress within the issues. So what can our readers look forward to in the next issues of The Cabinet? Okay, so next next issue, uh, well, issue three is pretty pedal to the metal action. I'd say issue four is double that in terms of pace, action, uh, things happening it's it's a lot of fun it's 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 your big your big action sequence uh but for the majority of the issue um when we're talking about our leads 
And then we're going to start to see more behind the curtain of these organizations that uh, are working with the cabinet trying to find it. And one of them is what we call the, the orderists, which are the good guys, the good protectors of the cabinet that are working with um, Avni and Trent, at least Minnie is, who was introduced in the second issue. Um, we're going to learn more about her organization. We're going to learn more about her situation. We're going to learn more about her superiors and their motives. So that world is going to start opening up now, kind of like that Tertiary, the tertiary world of of who's chasing the cabinet, who else wants it, and um, issue five, as David mentioned, which comes out in June, that is the last issue of this arc, and there will be, like David said, a resolution to this story. So we'll have the bow on top. But um, I will say, for every answer you get, maybe you'll get fourteen new questions. Uh, well, maybe not fourteen, but <laughs> that that's that's all I'll say. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, we 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 wrap it up in a bow, but we want you to just really understand that the box isn't there yet. You know, like the box is keep it keeps expanding, and we want and we do have a big fun world, and we feel that these first five issues are just our wonderful little tiny introduction to that big fun world. Um, and so, yeah, we want to keep on expanding, and we want to keep on growing. And issues four and five, they also really start to sort of peel back these wonderful layers of Avni's past and and what Avni. Um, what Avni's driven to even more to find out what may or may not have happened before she made this mistake that you saw in issue one. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we we um we get we get layered, but within our layers, as Jordan mentioned, we still have this awesome summer blockbuster esque adventure uh, yeah. within those pages. So yeah, and a TGIF reference, which I mentioned earlier. <laughs> so yeah, I can't forget that. Yeah, and a little more metal, a little more yeah, metal, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Correct. More, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Mr. Harbinger, Evil, um, Evil Toff, it was, thank you so much for talking with me. I look forward to reading the fourth edition of Cabinet. Thank you so much, guys. Thank Thanks, you. Yeah. It was a blast. It. Have a great night, guys. You, you too. too. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Traverse of Stars podcast. Please help me better the algorithms by liking and subscribing. Sure to turn for the next episode, David Popose boards the mothership to discuss space ghosts. Till next voyage, travel on. <laughs>